details attended to. I want to acknowledge the OCLC Research Library Partnership, which both underwrites and inspires our work. Attendees of this webinar are from the OCLC RLP, and we want to thank you for your continued support and input into our work. These are both crucial to our success. So before we turn things over to, um, to Emily for today's presentation, uh, I just want to uh, uh, turn things over to uh, uh, Senior Program Officer Chela Weber, who will provide some additional context for today's presentation. So take it away, Chela. Thanks, Marilee. Um, good morning, everyone, uh, or good morning to those of us in North America. Um, I don't know if we have any colleagues, um, international colleagues joining us today. Um, so hi, uh, thanks so much for being here. I'm excited to see so many folks. Um, I hope everyone is safe and healthy. Um, I am, I'm Chayla Scott Weber. I'm a senior program officer, as Marilee mentioned, here at OCLC with the Research Library Partnership. And my work uh, for RLP focuses on supporting learning and research related to archives, special and distinctive collections. Um, and that's a picture of me. Uh, um, so OCLC has a long history of work in the area of archives, special and distinctive collections in research libraries. We work in special collections because we understand them as an important site of knowledge creation. And we understand that that is made possible by libraries' commitment to the stewardship of their distinctive collections. We also know that the unique nature of material in special collections can make scaling work with them a challenge. And so we try to identify areas of common need and patterns of innovation to help libraries scale learning and expertise with these collections. Um, in 2018, we released the Research and Learning Agenda for Archive Special and Distinctive Collections in Research Libraries. It, the agenda was created through a participatory process with the Archives and Special Co uh, Collections community and is now guiding our work in this area. And it articulates shared challenges and opportunities research libraries are facing in this sphere and suggests some approaches uh, for working together on them. Um, one of the key priorities that was identified through the uh, agenda process is stewarding our AV collections. Um, AV holdings continue to be a top concern in archival repositories uh, because of evolving modes of scholarship in which these are increasingly valuable and sought after resources, because of preservation concern that many AV formats are at or near end of life, and because of the volume of AV holdings is just staggering and, and in many cases exceeds institutions' ability to do preservation reformatting. Um, we've been working over the last year to try to kind of to better understand the needs in this area beyond our initial conversations uh, in the creation of the agenda. Last year, we did a survey of the RLP membership, and then uh, following up on the survey, held a series of community conversations. And I wrote a couple of blog posts summarizing those, um, both of those activities and what we learned. And now, uh, responding to what you told us that you need, we're doing a series of webinars throughout 2020. Um, so one of the key takeaways for me from the survey and the subsequent conversations was that we really need to rethink our traditional approaches to AV in order to tackle the problem in front of us. The preservation risks coupled with the large volume of AV holdings and the short time window really mean we need to scale up our work at, on these collections. And working at scale amplifies the challenges of AV materials like uncertain copyright or lack of detailed descriptive information, and it also creates new challenges. Um, I think there are all kinds of different ways that a shift in mindset will be necessary to addressing the challenges of stewarding AV at scale. And so for this webinar series, we're asking partners from different RLP institutions who are working at scale and addressing different aspects of work with AV to share what they're doing and the ways that has challenged and shifted their mindset and ways of working. So today I'm really excited that Emily has agreed to talk to us about her work at University of Houston, um, taking lessons from MPLP and extensible processing uh, conversations and thinking about what kind of a golden minimum looks like for AV materials. Um, uh, feel free to ask questions and chat throughout. We'll be holding the discussion of, quest of uh, questions until the end, but 
feel free to um, uh, ask questions as we go. And um, with that, I'll turn it over to Emily. I'm just shifting things around here just a little bit. Okay, I think we're all set. Wonderful. Um, thank you so much. Okay, so good morning, and um, thank you particularly to these wonderful OCLC folks for coordinating today's talk, and thank you all for joining me for this Works in Progress webinar. My name is Emily Vincent, and I am the audiovisual archivist at the University of Houston. I'm a graduate from the University of Texas School of Information with an MSIS and a Certificate of Advanced Study in Preservation Administration. Prior to this current position, my audiovisual experience uh, comes from my role as a project archivist at New York Public Radio and um, as a fellow in the New York Public Library Barbara Goldsmith Preservation Division, including rotations through their audio and moving image preservation units. Like most of you, I'm working from home today, so should you hear any loud thuds pictured are my two possible co-presenters. The goals for today's presentation are to provide a little background about how audiovisual materials and archives have been managed in the past, how that affects our work today, and describe how the AV archives community has made the case that because these materials have many unique preservation and access considerations, that they do deserve some special attention. I'll describe a department-wide AV survey conducted in UH Special Collections, define the approach I'm calling Enhanced for AV Minimal Processing that we're currently using, and discuss the positive outcomes of these not inconsiderable investments of time and resources that both of these projects required. I'll also share some useful resources and take any questions you might have. Um, as the OCLC host uh, encouraged you, please chat them as they come to you and I'll answer them all at the end. And I'm also gonna be sharing a lot of resources and those links will all be made available along with the um, webinar recording and slides um, after the after the today's talk. Perhaps some of you, like me, watched the 1987 documentary Slow Fires in library school. The film described the problem of acidic paper, calling it a global crisis and cautioning that inaction would result in the destruction of our world's intellectual heritage. The argument was compelling, the risks were definite, and the call to action worked. Major investments were made in mass deacidification de efforts and preservation reformatting, then through microfilm and photocopying to acid-free paper and today through digitization. I often reflect that if acidic paper is a slow fire, surely unmanaged audiovisual collections are a wildfire. If you're attending this webinar, you probably understand why I use such a dire metaphor. Even very acidic paper documents have a decent hope of being salvaged. Perhaps not the actual piece of paper, but cheap and accessible technology, maybe just a photocopier or a cell phone camera, allows us to create a facsimile from rapidly crumbling documents. The preservation risks for AV are substantially more complex. The first reason for this is the fundamental inherent vice of many AV formats. That is to say, even when stored properly, these materials will continue to degrade, sometimes at alarmingly fast speeds. The degradation process is sped up when storage conditions haven't been ideal, which is often the case for an archival collection after decades spent in a garage, attic, or storage unit. This table outlines just a few formats common to many library and archive collections and their associated, associated degradation risks. They are likely very familiar. Who working in an AV collection hasn't encountered that telltale scent of vinegar wafting out of a film can or tried to copy a CDR that simply won't read? If we are to save the content that intellectual heritage Terry Sanders refers to in Slow Fires, we must be able to play the AV object at least once for digital capture. The urgency of this issue was underscored in the Library of Congress's 2012 National Recording Preservation Plan, which stated that endangered analog formats must be digitized within the next 15 or 20 years before further degradation makes preservation efforts all but impossible. The second major complexity of ensuring access to AV archives is mechanical obsolescence. That is, the eventual loss of the machines and technologies required to play the myriad formats on which our archival content is stored. The production of these machines is dependent on market demands that quickly ceases once a format has been replaced by a newer, cheaper, or better option. Even if the machines are still available in the secondhand market, the expertise and parts required to maintain them are increasingly unavailable. The third issue is one of simply not knowing what is contained on the audiovisual carriers in our collection. 
there are two aspects to this problem. The first is that frequently AV materials have inadequate or completely absent labeling. With film, as with paper-based objects, we benefit from being able to simply look at the object to gain some sort of knowledge of its content. But for the majority of AV formats, playback is the only way to understand what an underlabeled recording holds. The other part of this issue, and the topic of today's talk, is that at a much higher level, many in archives and libraries lack a holistic view of the audiovisual collections they hold. In 2009, Mike Casey presented the urgency of identifying and prioritizing audiovisual collections and planning for their digitization in the Indiana University Bloomington Media Preservation Survey. The survey, conducted across many units on the Bloomington campus, captured not only the enormous quantities of audiovisual materials held by the university, it also considered the research value of these holdings and the risk of degradation and obsolescence to them. In response, in 2013, the university president announced a $15 million investment in the university's media digitization and preservation initiative to digitally preserve and pride, provide access to all significant audio, video, and film recordings on the IU campuses by the IU Bicentennial in 2020. To date, they have digitized an astounding 326,000 plus audio and video recordings and almost 18,000 film reels. Since the 2009 survey, AC has written several excellent articles advocating for action to prevent, prevent the catastrophic loss of these materials and highlighting the excellent work being done throughout the country. This initiative and ones like it at New York Public Library, Stanford, University of Illinois, are certainly uh, sources of inspiration, but ultimately out of reach to many of us. The obstacles are familiar. Lack of funds, lack of staff are major ones, but simply not knowing where to start is another. To understand the root of the problem faced in many archives and the starting point for the works in progress at the University of Houston, it's worth taking a look back at how audiovisual collections have been managed historically. In the IPLA 2017 Guidelines for Audiovisual and Multimedia Collections Management in Libraries, the authors noted that while audiovisual works have been present in library collections since their mass production and public availability, they have often been regarded as the anomaly given the complexities associated with non-print materials and the specialized skill set to manage them. Mechanical sound and moving image recordings date back to the 19th century. The advent of increasingly more accessible and more affordable recording techniques throughout the mid to late 20th century led to an explosion of AV production by both professionals like broadcasters and amateur consumers. This graph is an inexhaustive visualization of the number of audio, film, and video emerging in each decade since 1870, based on the Museum of Complete Media's timeline. And this chart from the National Archives Identifying Video Formats Guide is another helpful visualization of rapid development and inevitable obsolescence of formats. One could imagine an equally involved chart for audio formats. What is impossible to capture in a chart is the variability within these formats. Things like differing video encoding standards or the huge inconsistency of quality of a given format across manufacturers or even, as is well documented in the case of quarter inch open reel audio tape, which we products developed by a single manufacturer. Ten years ago, Jackie Dooley and Catherine Luce published Taking Our Pulse, the OCLC Research Survey of Special Collections and Archives. Back then, 169 research libraries responded to their survey, providing a wealth of information about the student collections and challenges they face. The authors noted the incredible growth of AR collections with a 300% increase for visual and moving image material. 64% of respondents with AV collections reported an increased demand in these materials. However, only 25% reported having AV materials described online in catalog records, and 35% reported them described within archival records, though it's unclear what description that was. I would argue that if this survey were conducted again now, we would see another enormous jump in both AV holdings and in demand for access for these recordings. If we're to assume that there is something like an average lag of 30 to 50 years between creation and acquisition by an archive or special collection, it would stand that the, the um, growth of AV format availability that boomed in the 1980s and 90s is now resulting in our own boom of collections containing obsolete AV and that this growth will continue. At the University of Houston, it's more likely that a new accession will arrive with AV than not, 
and increasingly large AV only collections are being added to our holdings. Historically, in many archives, the approach to dealing with AV materials was much the same as dealing with paper based collections passive preservation, which is to say, process them, put them in a box on a shelf, hopefully in a stable environment, and leave them there. Until recently, there was little guidance provided in traditional archival processing literature about the management of these collections. However, beginning in the 1990s, as those twin threats of degradation and obsolescence became apparent, and with increasing urgency ever, ever since, practitioners have been advocating for a much more active approach towards audiovisual collections. This advocacy has been evident in the journals of the Association of Moving Image Archivists, International Association of Sound and Audiovisual Archivists, and the Association of Recorded Sound Collections. And likewise, major institutions and granting agencies have been investing in large-scale AV digitization efforts. In the spring of 2015, I joined the University of Houston Library's Special Collections as the library's first audiovisual archivist. When I was hired, both my role as direct supervisor and the department head positions were unfilled. In the case of libraries, we are often fond of discussing challenges and opportunities. And in my case, this unusual situation was certainly an opportunity for me to shape my position. My main priority was to establish some sort of AV preservation program within special collections. To me, this meant creating policies and procedures for handling, storing, describing, and making available these materials and also to build some sort of in-house digitization operation. To do this, I needed to better understand the nature of the collections I was tasked to manage. The University of Houston Library's Special Collections was established in 1968 with a focus on acquiring archival collections related to Houston and Texas. In the 1980s, the University Archives was established, and over the next 40 years, additional subject-specific collection areas have been added, such as the Hip Hop Research Collection, performing in visual arts and LGBT history. To date, University of Houston Library Special Collections is home to over 475 archival collections. The majority of these were created in the 20th century, and like many, many contemporary archival collections, most are what we would call a mixed collection containing paper, AV, and more digital materials. I decided the best approach to gaining an understanding of the AV holdings was to conduct a survey. My aim wasn't to get an item by item title list for each audiovisual object held in special collections. I wanted a high level snapshot that could tell me what formats we had a lot of and therefore might be worth investing in equipment for digitization. I also wanted to understand where our problem, smart, problem spots might lie. For example, were there thousands of DAS waiting for me and might there be grant opportunities to help special collections meet those challenges? I admit I began too optimistically expecting that I could rely on archival finding aids to gain an understanding of the extent of our AV in our department. It was almost immediately apparent that I wouldn't be conducting the survey from behind a computer screen. After an initial approach that involved searching the finding aid database for the usual suspects of AV terminology, such as tape and disc and the rest that you see on your screen, it became clear that although many of the process archival collections held AV, most finding aids did not reliably identify format or clearly convey quantity. In the three examples that follow, you can see the wide range of approaches in describing these materials within the UH archive. From a series simply called audiovisual, the only information available to us is that it contains assorted media. To a very specific item level accounting, with complete title and format identification to something in between, the most common um, finding aid scenario. Titles, sure, format also, but not linked together in a way that provided me with the information I needed to understand what was in our collection holistically. The only solution it seemed was to take a two pronged approach. Use finding aids as a starting point to identify collections that had AV and then go dig into boxes. In a small portion of collections, I was able to rely on the finding aid to supply the information I needed. However, most were not detailed enough to be useful for this survey. Um, as in the first example, finding aids often describe material simply as videos or tapes. This didn't come as a huge surprise. It reflected the professional literature of the past and a quick review of two legacy finding aids in our own archival records. I found the 1998 Department Processing Manual 
where there is only one reference to AV materials, which you can see a screenshot of, suggesting a series could be based on format. The manual makes no reference to special considerations related to identification, description, storage, or preservation of AV. Turning to the spreadsheet, across the top row, I added the formats I expected to find. As I came across a new format, I simply added a column. Though out of scope, it quickly became apparent that there had been a common practice of storing digital storage formats, floppy disks, zip drives, and more, to those all too common miscellaneous multimedia series. I opted to capture this information as well. The spreadsheet was too large to capture for a single screen for this webinar, but this just shows the um, top row of the survey just to give you an impression of the breadth of format. Down the first column, I added a list of all the process collections. Working as efficiently as possible, I assessed each collection. If possible, I derived all of the information from the finding aid. Otherwise, I conducted a quick visual inspection of the AV in the collection, creating a count of how many of each format were in a given uh, series. I used the basic addition function to tabulate a total for each format column and the grand total. As you can see, those format totals are in bold here. So this is just like the bottom sixth of the, well, not even, bottom twelfth of the spreadsheet. This eyes on approach wasn't only necessary to get an accurate sense of the scope of our audiovisual holdings, it provided me with an immensely valuable opportunity to get a general idea of the access and preservation issues. Were there collections that could easily be reprocessed to increase accessibility? Were materials stored properly? Were there major preservation issues going unnoticed, tucked away in boxes? Once complete, the survey revealed the UH Special Collections archival holdings held over 14,000 items on 35 different formats, not including the digital storage media. I expanded the survey to capture audiovisual holdings housed within Special Collections cataloged materials. This process proved far more straightforward and possible to assess entirely based on catalog records through UH's library's discovery system. Using the advanced search option, I conducted wildcard searches, limiting the subcollection to special collections and the format to various AV options, though I admit I had to open every record because, as you can see in the description field, the um, actual count of disks may vary than the The result was just over 3,000 items in the catalog material, overwhelmingly vinyl disks. Complicating my plan for a quick snapshot of the Special Collections AV was the fact that the single largest AV collection held were the recordings of the university-owned public television station KUHT, which were completely unprocessed. This collection arrived to Special Collections from the station in numerous accessions over more than 15 years. When I arrived, it consisted of more than 300 boxes of video and audio reels, several shelving units of stacked 16 millimeter films, and it had continued to grow after I arrived, including a memorable delivery of almost 1,000 one-inch open reel videotapes transported via a trailer on the back of a pickup truck. The KUHT collection, with recordings dating back to 1953, had no inventories and was completely inaccessible to researchers. Given its immense size, the potential preservation issues present, and its research value, I prioritized this collection for attention. Influenced by the work of Joshua Ranger, particularly a 2012 white paper titled, What's Your Product? Assessing the Suitability of a More Product, Less Process Methodology for Processing Audiovisual Collections, I approached this huge collection with an AV preservation mindset grounded in the practicality of Green and Messner's More Product, Less Process framework. To me, this meant approaching the processing of KUHT with something akin to series level accounting for the collection content but with an item level format identification and um, assessment of runtime. Once again, a basic Google spreadsheet was the most expedient option for this process. I now benefited from the assistance of a student employee and this, uh, this uh, Google spreadsheet allowed for easy collaboration and flexibility to change the approach as needed. This flexibility ended up being crucial because as I worked through the different editions, I realized my initial plan would need to adjust to the complexities of the collection. I should also mention that this project was a long and slow one that I picked up and left after uh, many times over a two-year period. 
I began working with the easiest areas of the collection first. In this case, it was the most recent addition. A couple hundred boxes had more had come in that represented materials from the 1990s and the 2000s. These materials were ideal for the enhanced for AV minimal processing approach because they had arrived in labeled boxes, identifying what television program they were associated with. There were also only a few number, a, a few different formats represented in this portion of the collection. Most everything was either an episode or an unprocessed element, uh, unproduced element associated with an episode, almost always on Betacam, Betacam SP, or DigiBeta. Prior to my arrival at UH Special Collections, several ranges of dedicated AV shelving had been installed and earmarked for this collection. Because of this, I was able to utilize the space and we began processing while simultaneously improving storage conditions by moving the improperly housed videos out of boxes and onto shelves. To maximize the efficiency in our processing spreadsheet, we use the KUHT supplied box labels to create minimal intellectual control, then counted the number of items for each format in the box, maximum runtime, and shelf location where we were housing them. This process was fast, and we benefited from a general um, consistency across a given box. The decision to record maximum runtime was based on the need to have some technical data points that would allow for digital storage planning should the collection be digitized. And I also thought they could be used, this information could be used as a compelling advocacy tool to describe what the risk of loss was in hours rather simply in items. Other phases of the KUHT processing project were not so simple. Another group of about 300 boxes of videos, mostly created from the 1970s to the 1990s, had no apparent order. Rather than reflecting a produced series, videos in this part of the collection tended to be singular items, such as one-off episodes, documentaries, and B-roll. This portion of the collection had a much greater variety of formats, including open reel video, UMATIC, VHS, Betacam, and audio format. The enhanced for AV minimal processing approach that I had used earlier did not apply to this disorganized and varied portion of the collection. Ultimately, I decided the only reasonable approach was an item level accounting of assets. Returning to the spreadsheet, I added columns for the title, production date, air date, additional label information, and actual runtime if it was specified for each item. There were many, many occasions when many of these fields were unknowable. Labeling practices had varied widely and occasionally were completely absent. So our approach was always to just glean as much useful information as we could and move on. As with the survey, this hands-on approach created opportunities to better understand the collection and begin to formulate preservation goals. For example, during the film phase of the KUHT inventory, I was able to slip 80 test strips into a sample selection of film cans to measure the levels of deterioration present. Once completed, the KUHT film and video collection inventory totaled just over 14,000 items. I eventually used Open Refine to clean and normalize the data, which uh, the student assistant and I had entered over a two-year period to improve accuracy. The most common formats reflected those most common to the broadcast industry, Betacam, Betacam, Cam, Cam In the years since this initial project, we've taken an iterative approach to improving the inventories as suggested in Anthony Cusciola's Moving Image and Sound Collections for Archivists. Propelled by grant opportunities and research interests, several years on, many KUHT series level descriptions have been refined to the item level. A direct outcome of the KUHT inventory was the ability to effectively apply for and receive grant funding for collection digitization. Through the support of the Texas State Library and Archives Commission Tech Treasures Grant and the Clear Recordings at Risk Grant, over 800 films and videos in the collection have been digitized, described, and now are now available online. This online presence, as well as the opportunity to include our metadata records with the American Archives of Public Broadcasting, has considerably raised demand for these collections. I now receive regular research inquiries, most often from podcast and documentary producers, requesting use of these materials. Another outcome of the large scale survey and the large KUHT inventory project was the ability to better plan and advocate within the UH libraries for digitization equipment and digital storage. Today, we are able to digitize six formats on site, increasing our ability to provide on demand access to collections, which to date has enabled the reformatting of about 200 items. 
These two outcomes, grant funding and raising an awareness within my own institution, are, I think, the most powerful arguments for trying to process AV materials as something more than minimal. Accurate and detailed data about what is in your collection, coupled with a clear argument about the risk that the content held on these fragile carriers may be completely lost in the near future, is compelling. It is vital that we are able to stress the need for holistic planning, which prioritizes the most at-risk and most valuable materials. There have been ample opportunities to test the Enhance for AV minimal processing approach. The majority of new acquisitions in the intervening years have contained audiovisual materials, growing our total holdings to over 40,000 assets. Most recently, we used this approach on a new acquisition of almost 6,000 AV items acquired from the UH Athletics Department. Following much the same procedure, two student employees efficiently produced an inventory at the box level that included basic intellectual data pulled from box labels and a quick assessment of the box content for technical information. We have the, the technical information we have deemed the minimum for materials. This process, like the KUHT inventory, was also an opportunity to simultaneously rehouse these collections, which had been donated haphazardly housed in oversized boxes into improved housing. Our department as a whole now approaches AV collections differently. I work closely with the curators, often before a collection is even acquired, to plan for its processing and determine if a more detailed inventory should be considered or if it might be a candidate for an iterative approach. First, making the minimal inventory available to researchers with the option to augment, excuse me, with the option to augment it as demand is demonstrated. I also work with the student pro processors, providing a template for the AV process, a walkthrough of expectation, and resources to aid in expectation. Um, I want to acknowledge that this approach won't be accessible to everyone. Many institutions will likely never have a dedicated AV person. However, there are a lot of incredible free resources available out there to help non-specialists with the task of identifying their collection. Listed here and linked later um, are some format identification guides that not only help in determining what you have, but also provide excellent information about the degradation and obsolescent risk of specific formats. These resources, uh, particularly the first one, the Preservation Self-Assessment Program, um, as well as the Video Preservation Format Identification Guide, use strong language that describes the critical risk to carriers that can be an effective tool to argue to your administration for funding and also to grant funders. Additionally, there are several tools available to facilitate the creation of an item level inventory and to aid in the appraisal of and preservation planning for AV collections. Among these AV is um, AV Compass, a free tool created by the Bay Area Video Coalition, which includes educational videos, step-by-step -step instructions, and user guides from to guide a user from identification through planning, storage, and preservation. AVCC is an open source application developed by AVP, which allows users to create um, an inventory on a web-based platform. It provides the flexibility to create minimal records based on a few required fields or an inventory with more robust records that can include a description if the item is unique or commercial and it's a genre term. The data collected in AVCC can be exported in reports that calculate potential file size, linear footage needs, and a prioritization score. The tool inventory data storage are free for accounts um, under 2,500 records, but have a subscription fee for larger inventory. Another web-based application is the Preservation Self-Assessment Program developed by the University of Illinois Libraries with the support of IMLS. Expanding on the audiovisual self-assessment program's previous tool, PSAP is intended to help collection managers identify and assess AV, photograph, and paper materials. It allows users to create an item level inventory or a collection level assessment on their web-based platform. Finally, there are two um, older Microsoft Access-based database options, Columbia's Audio uh, Moving Image Survey Instrument and NYU's Vipers, which were developed in 2007 and 2006, respectively. So with that, um, I hope I've given you a, a a broad overview of the work in progress at the University of Houston, and I would be happy to you answer questions. Um, Great, thank you, Emily. We've had um, lots of questions rolling in <laughs> as you've been presenting. Um, 
Uh, since you were just giving suggestions of those tools, I'll ask this the, the last question that came in, and then I'll go back to the beginning. Um, did you use an inventory tool? And uh, if so, which one? And, and if not, why not? <laughs> um, I didn't. I did. I did look at them, and the one I looked the most closely and considered using was AVP's AVCC, which has like really excellent functionality. But um, as I mentioned, this was a multi-year project because it was the sort of thing that I did. Um, I picked up and left behind as I had time with my other job responsibilities. And that is a fee-based service for over 2,500 items, and I knew I'd be going over 2,500 items. And I knew it would take a while. So, um, and I, my department, I mean, not my department, but um, my, the audiovisual unit, I guess I can call myself a unit, um, doesn't have a budget. <laughs> so I, uh, I thought something free would work well. And I think also I didn't, I truly didn't know what I was doing when I started. So I, I didn't know what data I would want to collect. And so just having the flexibility of a, simple spreadsheet and particularly working with a student who was already familiar with Google Docs, um, it just made for an easy option. But I, I do think the tools have like excellent potential and for the right fit would be just phenomenal in helping you make your case for fund, excuse me, for funding or just for getting a, a handle on what your collections hold. Great, thank you. Um, let's see, we had a couple of questions um, about uh, let's see, um, about kind of criteria about, uh, so Jim Kuhn asks what, um, on what criteria should you decide to stand up in-house digitization services versus relying solely on primarily, solely or primarily on vendor provided conversion? Um, and we had another, uh, and Carla Irwin at UNLV also asked, what formats do you do, decide to digitize on site? Um, yeah. And, yeah. So can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. So um, I made the decision for the formats to do on site based on two factors. One, the most common factors, I mean, the most common formats, and two, the ones that I felt were a bit more stable and therefore I was more capable, capable of approaching myself. So for example, we have lots and lots of umatics, but I did not, I decided that that was one that was probably best left to a vendor. I don't have um, the ability to bake tapes in-house uh, and also they're like a sort of notoriously finicky format. So I decided to, to really stick with what I knew, which was audio tape, uh, you know, cassette tape, uh, VHS, uh, Betacam, DigiBeta, those formats that were a little bit more um, familiar and accessible to me. And I think that's just sort of, each um, each archivist kind of has to make their own decision. Um, and also it was a matter of affordability. So like, you know, deck prices vary widely. So um, the decks I chose are ones that were a little bit more affordable and, and made the whole digi unit a little bit more accessible to get funded. Um, so yeah, but like I, like I don't think I will I think I'll always send out DATs. I think I'll always send out umatics. Like some of those trickier formats, I think maybe are are better dealt with at like a large scale by a vendor than as a one-off by me. Great. Um, thank you. Uh, and let's see. Um, we had a whole conversation <laughs> about kind of um, original boxes and. Um, and uh, do you uh, do you discard original? Let's see. Sorry. Um, what's the what's the or what is the recommendation for retention of original format after the item's been reformatted? Well, we keep everything after it's been reformatted. And then when I talk about boxes, I'm talking about like big cardboard boxes that like a bunch of tapes have been dumped into, not like the tape cases. So we would not discard the like original, you know, tape case. But um, for example, the athletics collection that I mentioned, the 6,000 items from the athletics collection, truly it was like they had just taken their arm and like run it down a shelf and put everything into like a giant like Nike box, um, that, <laughs> like took two people to lift. So when I talk about boxes, I'm not talking about like the like cassette case. I'm talking about 
the um, the the large box labeled soccer that came to us that had uh, 300 things in it. So those okay. are what uh, we addressed, and 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 that was the preservation concern because things were um, piled on top of each other. They were oriented in the wrong direction. Um, and there there was a pretty significant risk. You know, there would be like 100 DVDs underneath, you know, 70 VHSs. It was just madness. So when I talk about boxes, that's what I'm talking about. Okay. And then um, do you do any uh, work to try to digitize or take photos or Xerox those boxes um, in all of this work? Have you considered that? So um, I do, I have done uh, photographs of the, like, for example, if there's a cassette with um, handwritten track list or, or, you know, description of the content, I'll, I do do photographs of those. Not of these like sort of shipping boxes. I haven't taken taken photos or or digitized any of that information. Really, in both the KUHT and in the um, uh, athletics examples, they were kind of like you know post-it notes with like just notations like oh this is um, this is from the series almanac or or this is you know television series almanac or this is from the soccer um, team. They weren't. I didn't deem them to have like intellectual value beyond just giving us insight about what was contained in the box. Great, thank you. Um, let's see. And um, uh, someone asked if you had. Um, this is, a, I guess, a little later in the process, but do you conduct sensitivity assessments for sensitive content of the AV materials? Um, and if so, what's your approach to doing that? That's a that's an interesting question. Um, we certainly have had materials with very sensitive content, and really the only we still provide access if it's like a a researcher request, just with like a a bit of a disclaimer to let them know what to expect. So far, the two examples that I that really come to mind that were um, Maybe a bit um, more sensitive. I I truly don't think we could put them online. They're um, very graphic. So those neither of the two that they're from two different collections pop out. Neither of those is online. However, we do have a lot of material on our uh, digital library that uses sort of racially insensitive language because they were produced in the 1950s and 60s and uh, um, and just use sort of like uh, very dated language. And so those are still online, and we just kind of put up a boilerplate that says, you know, this was produced um, in a different era and uses language that may be offensive. And so that's sort of our approach is to keep it accessible. Uh, we don't edit it out or anything, but we just let people know that it it could be um, potentially upsetting. Okay. Um, and um, we've got a follow-up question to that. What about personal? Personal sensitive inf information and um, Rado, do you mean like like someone's telling personal information about themselves and or stories? Oh, medical records. Oh, um, wait, that hasn't come up for us. I do have a colleague over at um, the McGovern Historical, which is uh, the archive of a of a hospital here in or of a medical center here in Houston, and they have, it's, it's fascinating, they have like uh, the first open heart surgeries and that sort of thing, and those films were made, I think, in the 50s and 60s, and so they just show the patient's face, and there's like no sort of um, uh, effort to make it anonymous. I mean, that was well before a lot of the laws were in place to protect people's medical information, and I think that what they've decided is that those can't, those have to be um, obscured, like they have to protect the person's identity, even though the person is very likely, you know, uh, long since passed. Um, but that's not something we, I don't think we have any sort of medical type information in ours. Gotcha. Okay. Um, and, uh, um, oh, I'm sorry, going back to the, the, the question about carrier uh, photos of original carriers, are you making those available to researchers at all? And if so, how? 
Uh, n not so far, though. Um, we just got a really significant um, NEH grant to work on this, uh, like 35 years of LGBT radio television productions in Houston. And I think it would be the the uh, radio program is all stored on cassette tapes with like uh, detailed handwritten labels. And I think it would be really wonderful to make those available because they have, um, you know, a lot of uh, research value. So mm -hmm. um, that is a good question. We haven't, we have a little bit of a limitation within our system because our AV repository isn't fully integrated into our digital library. So it's not like a really fantastic way of like, of like displaying both a uh, still object and an AV object in the same um, platform. So that's a challenge we have not addressed yet. Gotcha. Um... Let's see. And uh, question, what are the pros and cons to box level or iter iterative processing of AV items rather than item level in instances where acclimatization is concerned? Mm. I'm not sure I understand the, well, I mean, the reason that we did the like sort of um, box level and iterative is that there were some, so just going back to the KUHT collection, for example, there were some um, series within that collection that like it truly didn't seem like a, so for example, there was this program on Mary Lou Retton had a television show called Mary Lou's Flip Flop Shop. We, <laughs> we had every work tape, every B-roll, every episode of that um, across several boxes. And so for that collection, we just have that it's Mary Lou's Flip Flop Shop and what format it is, it just didn't seem like there was going to be like a very high demand to go through and individually label the um, every single element that we had, that we have hundreds of tapes for this show that like, should someone become very interested in, we can absolutely like go into it and make a more detailed inventory. But having never received a research request for that portion of the collection, it just didn't seem like uh, the best use of our resources when we have so many other collections coming in to um, to do like an item level inventory. It seemed like a, a series level was adequate. Great. Um, Chris, uh, if that didn't answer your question and you wanna provide some more detail on your question, please feel free to drop that in the chat. Yeah, I'm sorry um, if I missed the climate <laughs> part. Yeah, yeah, I w I'm actually, I wasn't sure exactly either. So, um, okay, let's see. Um, uh, I, I had a question. You mentioned that um, a couple of times making decisions around um, uh, thinking, thinking in terms of advocacy for the next steps in the program, um, for setting up digitization, uh, for advocating for resources. Can you talk a little bit more about kind of thinking in terms of ad advocacy and maybe successes or, or challenges in that area? Yeah, so I think that um... From the very beginning at this position, I felt like it was like clear that I would have to um, certainly seek because AV projects are just like undeniably expensive. Um, I thought it was clear that I would have to seek outside funding. And then also in an academic library, like I wasn't sure that maybe my administration was like really um, attuned to the value of these collections. Uh, you know, they have many, many responsibilities. So like kind of making your voice heard is a challenge. And so I think that being able to use um, these like really staggeringly large numbers of like the size of our collection and couple that with the um, very strong language coming out of like Library of Congress and um, Indiana and these various like uh, other publications, many of which I kind of quoted from in this presentation that really uh, hit home how dire things are, I think is like a pretty strong tool and maybe, you know, the most compelling way to both gain your sort of internal stakeholders support, but also that grant support, which I, to me is I, the only way forward, I, I feel like. So, um, you know, I relied a lot on the language and like, I think I mentioned in the like uh, preservation self-assessment programs guide, that, that this format is, you know, 
in critical condition. Like, I think that that is a compelling argument and having sort of a authority to quote from to not just say like, it's not just me saying that this matters. There's like this whole community that is really um, kind of fighting for the the long term preservation of these materials and and really um, hitting home the urgency of like action now that like it, it can't wait. Um, so, yeah, I think that I think that that is like really one of the most powerful um, outcomes of doing such a like kind of I mean, inventories are not that interesting. They're like not or surveys, you know, they're like a long slog. There's like a lot of um, time commitment. But I think being able to like tell your administrators that you have hundreds of thousands of hours of material that has just got 15 or 20 years at most makes a, a really compelling argument. Great, thank you. Um, and we do have an up, I'll just put a plug in for an upcoming um, uh, webinar where folks from um, the Smithsonian will be talking about their pan-institutional survey and the advocacy that they are doing with that data. Um, so it's, I know advocacy is a question that a lot of uh, folks are, are interested in around AV. Um, uh, so an, another question, changing tracks here. Um, uh, do you have any thoughts on uh, the overlap or distinction between computer media and AV media, for example, is a home burn DVD with a bunch of MP4s on it, computer media, AV media, or both? Oh, that's a great question. Um, and a super gray area. So um, I think in my institution, I think it is very dependent on institution. We don't have a, like a specific like digital archivist who just does that work. So in my institution, that often falls to me. Um, I think in other institutions it would be different. Like it just depends sort of on your staffing ability and your resources. Um, so, so at UH it it's AV, but um, we also kind of are all in it together. So my uh, colleague and supervisor is a digital as coordinator of digital projects, and so sometimes she'll take those, and sometimes I'll take them, and it just sort of depends on um, who has the time. So. Uh, yeah, that's a that's a great question and, and a very gray area, but um, for for us, it's it usually falls on my my end of things. Gotcha. Um, and uh, I think a great interesting question: um, Has your institution turned down gifts because of media content and the in inability to process or reformat that media? Um, I I would. I think certainly historically, like certainly before I was um, on staff, that happened. Um, I'm not aware of it happening since I've been there because I think there is like the feeling that like we now have like some of the tools to like manage these projects. But we have, I think, um, been critical of things like if they're already in really bad condition or if they're like largely unlabeled collections. Like, is it really is it worth our resources? You know, and everyone's running out of space and everyone's running out of resources um, if there are like a largely unlabeled collections I think that's like the biggest um, sort of red flag that maybe we would like take a, a pause before taking a collection that is not well documented mm -hmm. because of the increment of work the yeah. large increment of work that that would require it's yeah. fun day to my knowledge no one would fund like a digitization project for mystery media, you know, that you just like, <laughs> you see, like all, you know, like Seinfeld reruns, you just don't know. Um, right. So that would be my biggest sort of reason that like I would think twice about suggesting taking a collection. Great. Um, and Rebecca, who asked this question, I'll, I'll also put in a plug for um, some tools that, that uh, the, the OCLC RLP will be putting out. Um, uh, later this year uh, f from our collection building and operational impacts working group that try to give we're trying to give folks tools to talk about um, the operational impact of bringing in of potentially bringing in a new collection and thinking through kind of that total cost of ownership model of what does it mean to commit to the stewardship of this collection and and not necessarily advocating for an outcome of taking or not taking it but having good conversations about um, what it means to responsibly take in and manage something. Um, and uh, Marilee just dropped that uh, link into the chat. Um, let's see. 
I'm going to take one last question here. Um, uh, and Mary Jackson asks, does advocating for collections need to focus on obsolescence? How do you advocate for institutional investment for the uniqueness of materials if there's no funding to process those materials to gain information content in the first place? Hmm. I mean, that's, that's a great question. Um, I mean, that, that's a great question. I think, um, well, I think that actually, like, interestingly goes back to that um, operational impact uh, upcoming webinar that you just discussed, because if you've already agreed to house a collection, you, you owe something to that, right? Like, and so I think you have to try to start those conversations to gain institutional investment in, in finding out what the uniqueness of those collections is. And then hopefully that too will um, result in some support to actually digitize or, or process the collection. Um, because if you've, you know, if you've made the commitment to include it in your archive, um, yeah, there has to be investment in, in understanding what it is. Yeah. Does, that, does that make sense? I'm not sure. Yeah. I think so. Um, I, I'm, I, Feel that I've probably lost a question or two, and I'm sorry, folks, because um, we're we're at time. Um, but I am so grateful to everyone for coming today and for your great uh, engagement and questions. And Emily, um, thank you so much for this presentation and sharing your work. Um, we've got uh, some other great webinars coming up, so I'll encourage you to check out the calendar and join us again. Um, Marilee, do you have any? No, I think that's it. I just want to um, echo Chela's thanks to uh, to our fantastic audience today, to Emily for providing so much uh, fodder for thought and consideration and wisdom for us today. We really appreciate all of your participation in the webinar today. We'll be posting a webinar, a recording of the webinar online, as well as links to the many resources that were um, uh, supplied by Emily and also suggested in chat. Um, some pointers to upcoming webinars that we hope you guys will be excited about, and uh, we will send that all out to you just as soon as our fabulous communications team has had a chance to process everything. So thank you once again for joining us today, and 